I was reading a story about a poor lady who was in a grocery store, and while she was shopping, she ran into a pastor who was known to pastor a wealthy church. It was the church on the other side of the tracks. They were known to discriminate against poor people. And so this lady said to the pastor, you know, I visited your church a couple of weeks ago, and I'm considering joining the church. And the pastor was taken back by that, and he said to her, well, let's not be too rash here. Why don't you go home, and why don't you take a couple of months to pray about it, and then see what the Lord says, and then make a decision whether or not you want to join the church. Well, of course, he was hoping she'd forget about it and not become a part of their church. Well, she prayed about it, and two months later, she ran into the pastor again, and she said, Pastor, I, I did what you told me to do. I, I prayed about whether or not I should become a member of your church and join it. He said, well, okay. He said, what did the Lord tell you? She said, interestingly, the Lord told me not to bother joining your church because he had been trying to get into that church for many years and hasn't been able to. <laughs> Discrimination is a problem universally because it's rooted in the sinful heart of mankind. And God's people are not immune to discrimination. We see this throughout Scripture. For example, we know that the Jewish people hated the Gentiles. This could be seen in Jonah in the Old Testament. Jonah was commissioned by God to go preach the gospel to the Assyrians. And, of course, he went in the other direction because he had a dislike and antipathy towards Gentiles. He didn't want to see the Assyrians get saved. You read the Gospels, you read the book of Acts, we know that the Jewish people hated Gentiles. They hated Samaritans because Samaritans were half-breeds. They were half-Gentile, half-Jew, and so they looked down on them. So God's people are not immune from struggling with discrimination. In fact, some people are Christians and they struggle with it because they were raised in a home where that was modeled for them. Michael Hudeman said this about discrimination, and I think it's very important in how we all battle it. He says, quote, no human being is fully free of prejudice or discrimination. It's part of our selfish nature to prefer those of our own kind, whatever that represents to us. Races tend to congregate in their own neighborhoods and churches, preferring their way of doing things to that of other races or nationalities. Preferences are fine, as long as they don't turn into legalistic discrimination against believers who defer on non-essential aspects of the faith. Without realizing it, we can all be guilty of discrimination. Legalists discriminate against those they judge as rebels, while rebels discriminate against traditionalists. The goal should be to disagree without discriminating." End quote. He's right. We all battle it. We all have our preferences. Now, if discrimination is left unchecked, two things often result. Number one is negative stereotypes. And we've seen negative stereotypes emerge out of the culture of discrimination. Here are some of them. You've heard them. All Arabs are terrorists. That's a stereotype. All African Americans are criminals. That's a stereotype. All whites are white supremacists. That's a stereotype. By the way, that's the foundation of the critical race theory. It basically says that white supremacy is woven into the fabric of society, and we need to overthrow that. How about this one? All Italians are angry. All Polish people are dumb. All Jews are stingy. All who live in a trailer live like trash. All Irish people are drunks. All cops are racist. And then there's this one. All politicians are corrupt. Now, I need to think about that one for a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. So that's the first thing that emerges from a culture of discrimination. If it's left unchecked, you get these stereotypes that arise from that. But there's another thing that arises from discrimination if left unchecked, and that is unbiblical movements or ideologies or philosophies. For example, Black Panthers, Black Lives Matter. Antifa, the social justice movement, or take the philosophy of Marxism. See, these are all overreactions to legitimate discrimination. What happens is we swing the pendulum to the other degree, and we end up with these movements or these unbiblical ideologies. Now, I remember two weeks ago, when we talked about this subject, I mentioned to you that we must distinguish between sinful discrimination and biblical discrimination. We have to make that distinction. 
The Bible commands us to judge. The Bible commands us to be discerning. When anybody says Christians ought not judge, that is totally an unbiblical statement. What I think they mean by that is Christians should not have a judgmental attitude. There's a difference between judging and judgmentalism. We are called to judge. Jesus said this in John chapter 7. We are called to discern right from wrong, truth from error. The Bible mandates that we do that, but what the Bible condemns is hypocritical judging or judgmentalism where I look down on other people. But make no mistake about it, we are called to balance love and truth. In fact, there's a pastor that pastors Cornerstone Chapel in Virginia. His name is Gary Hamerick. He's a great preacher. He was telling the story about this uh, transgender that came to the church and they wanted to minister love to this person. I don't think the person was a believer, and they wanted to love them the way Christ loves them. But they also exercised truth because they told the individual, you cannot use the bathroom that you identify with. See, there's a balance of love and truth. We love you, but there's certain lines of demarcation that we're not going to cross, and we have to speak the truth in love. And so the Bible says that we are to reject sinful discrimination. James tells us this, so turn to James chapter 2 as we look at the second part in our message on avoiding sinful discrimination. We're looking at verses 1 through 13. And James, if you remember, is writing to a group of beleaguered Jewish Christians. They were scattered probably during the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts chapter 8. And according to chapter 1, verse 1, he says he's writing to the Jews that are scattered. And basically, he's writing to a group of poor Jewish Christians that were bereft of financial support. Many of them were struggling. And James has to deal with this subject of discrimination in chapter 2, and here's the reason why. You had many of the rich in the congregation or congregations to whom James was writing to, many of the rich were exploiting the poor. They were using them as a means to accomplish work, and they weren't paying their wages, according to James chapter 5. And so the rich were discriminating against the poor. On the other hand, according to chapter 2, the poor were engaging in discrimination or preferential treatment because when a rich person would come into the church and they were decked out, the ushers, as it were, or the congregants would show favoritism or preferential treatment towards that rich person because they wanted to curry their favor. They were poor, and they figured if they curried the favor of the rich person, basically they would benefit from them. And so James says, look, that's wrong just as well. Whether it's the rich oppressing the poor or the poor showing preferential treatment towards the rich, he's saying that's prejudice, it's judging, it's discrimination, and so James has to address this issue. Now, as we embark upon this text, I mentioned to you that there are six reasons why you and I are to reject sinful discrimination. We looked at the first three a couple weeks ago. Let me review them, and then we'll pick up the remainder three for this morning. First of all, we are to reject sinful discrimination because it is inconsistent with being a Christian. Remember in verse 1, he said, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. In other words, the two are mutually exclusive. They're incompatible. To say that I'm a Christian and exercise an attitude of discrimination or preferential treatment, the two do not mix. And James says, don't do that. Secondly, by way of review, he says it is often based on sinful motives. We are to reject it because typically when anybody engages in discrimination or preferential treatment, there is often a sinful motivation that is attached to it. It could be greed, it could be lust, it could be power. There is some type of motive. In this case, the poor were showing preferential treatment towards the rich because they wanted something from them financially. And what was happening was they were basically mistreating other poor people. And so James says, don't do that because typically the motive's wrong. Whenever you and I engage in this, we need to ask ourselves this question. What is my motive here? Why am I acting this way? Why is my attitude the way it is? A third reason why we're to reject sinful discrimination is it fails to see people the way God does. In verses 5 through 7, James says, do you not, that, do you not know that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? In other words, he's saying to them, 
you're not seeing the poor the way God sees them. You're looking at the externals. God sees them differently. Now, he's not saying that all poor people are given a passage to heaven because they're poor. We know that all poor people don't necessarily accept the gospel, nor is he saying that rich people can't be saved, although it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to be saved. But his point is, we need to see people the way God sees them through the lens of Scripture. For example, do you see the homeless the way God sees them? Yes, you look at the externals to a certain degree. We understand that. But do you go beyond the externals and look and say, you know what? They need Jesus Christ. The immigrant. Yes, we may not agree with illegal immigration, but the ones who are here, do we love them? Do we try to minister to them? Or let me bring it to home and let me make it very personal. Some of you do not like Joe Biden. Some of you do not like Donald Trump. Some of you like Joe Biden. Some of you like Donald Trump. Whatever your political spectrum, do you see both of those gentlemen? Do you see people within the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and those in the middle? Do you see them through the lens of Scripture? Do you see them through the eyes of God? I'm not asking you to give up your politics, but listen, we need to transcend our politics in order to see people the way God sees them. In spite of the fact that you may not like Joe Biden, do you see where he needs Jesus Christ? In spite of the fact that you may not like Donald Trump, do you see that Donald Trump needs Jesus Christ, although he professes to be saved? It's hard to tell sometimes. We got to see people through the eyes of God. And listen, we won't do that unless we're programmed by Scripture. Well, there's a fourth reason, and here's where we pick up for this morning, why we need to reject sinful discrimination, and that is this. It fails to demonstrate biblical love. It fails to demonstrate biblical love. Notice, if you will, verse 8 of James chapter 2. He says, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law. Now, what is the royal law? That's the supreme law. It's Scripture. Here he's talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. But he says, if you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, and here is the royal law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Now, when he quotes, love your neighbor as yourself, he's quoting from the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where God, even in the Old Testament, says that we're to love others. And then, of course, Jesus reiterated the Old Testament in Matthew 22, where he says you could take all the commandments and sum them up into two, love God and love your neighbor. And James is saying, look, if you are fulfilling the royal law, which says love your neighbor as yourself, he says you're doing good. In other words, you're not going to show discrimination. And so here is a fourth principle on why we should reject sinful discrimination is it demonstrates a lack of love when we exercise discrimination towards others. And the Bible says clearly that we are to love others as we love ourselves. Now, listen, we all love ourselves instinctively. God knows that. In fact, this morning, most of you showered, I hope. Many of you brushed your teeth when you got up in the morning. Why do you do that? Well, partly you want to feel clean, but also you don't want to be an offense to other people. When you get hungry for something, you get a hankering for Mexican food. What do you do? If you can afford it, you go get it. You see, we love ourselves. We make a lot of decisions that affect us. We ask the question subconsciously, how is this going to affect me? And to a certain degree, there's nothing wrong with that. And so God says, to the same degree that you love yourself and you care for yourself, it's to that degree that we are to love other people. And this love, by the way, is not emotional love. It's not sentimental love. It's not sexual love. It is agapao. It is agape love. It is the love of choice. It is the love of will. It is a sacrificial love. And obviously, we all fail in this issue. But if I love other people the way God does... And the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. If I'm loving people the way God does, I am not going to engage in preferential treatment in a bad way or engage in discrimination. I remember last year I got a call from a lady in the church that I came from in South Carolina. And she said, Mike, could you do me a favor? She said, I have a cousin who basically is homosexual, and he's struggling with his faith. He was raised in a Christian home, but he's been in the homosexual lifestyle. Would you talk to him because he has questions? I said, sure. Now, I could have said at that point, no, I don't want to talk to them. I don't have anything to do with them. See, that would be unbiblical. It would be unloving. 
But I know God loves all people regardless of their lifestyle. And so I sat down and I talked to this young man. We had about an hour and a half conversation, and he asked me a question. He says, Mike, I struggle with this. I struggled from the time I was younger. Can you be born a homosexual? We went into all those questions, and I graciously showed him love and truth, love and truth. After our hour and a half conversation, he went home. He decided to reject his homosexual lifestyle and to follow Christ. I talked to him this last week. He's getting ready to go to Liberty University. He's going to go into full-time ministry. Now, I say that not to say, look at Mike Nimmer, aren't I great? Not at all. I was simply the conduit. But you know what? If I didn't show him love and I decided I was going to have a vengeful, hateful attitude because of his lifestyle, you know what? It could have turned him away from Christianity. You get that church out in Kansas City where you have that guy Fred Phelps where they hang up signs that says God hates fags. See, that kind of stuff doesn't demonstrate biblical love. Now, you got to be careful when we talk about loving other people because love must be qualified by the truth. You often hear people say, well, if you love me, you're going to tolerate what I do. Here is a common thing. People say, if you don't accept my gay lifestyle, you don't love me. If you don't accept my transgenderism, you don't love me. See, the problem with that is biblical love must be confined by the guardrails of truth. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love rejoices with the truth. You cannot divorce love from the truth. God loves people, but God operates in the confines of truth. Why? Because God is a God of truth. For example, God loves the sinner unconditionally, but God also loves them within the truth because God tells them, if you reject my son Jesus Christ and die without him, you will spend eternity separated from me in hell. See, God loves, but he loves with truth. And so we have to be careful that when we say, well, we need to love everybody, that's true. But we also need to speak the truth. The Bible says we are to balance love and truth. And today, in the American church, you got churches that are all truth. And what happens is when you have all truth and no love, you have harshness, legalism, and Phariseeism. On the other hand, you have churches on this side that are all love, and they jettison the truth, and what happens is is you have liberalism. You basically have sloppy agape. You have beanbag Christianity. It's mushy and it's soft, but it's not based on the truth. And so we must balance this idea of, yes, we are called to fulfill the royal law, and if I love others, I'm not going to discriminate against them, but love must be confined by the truth. There's a fifth reason why we're to reject sinful discrimination, and that is this. It is a violation of the law of God. It is a violation of the law of God. Notice what he says in verse 9. But if you show partiality, and that's what the poor were doing towards the rich, you are committing sin. Now that word committing sin there is missing the mark. It's used of a bullseye. And listen, when we commit preferential treatment or discrimination, we're missing the bullseye of God's perfect standard because God says we're not to do that. And so he says, if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And then he goes further in verse 9, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Different word in the Greek, it means someone who goes beyond the law of God. They transgress the law of God. So we miss the mark when we show discrimination, but we also transgress the law of God. And listen, James is calling it out for what it is, because look what he says, whoever, verse 10, keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. What is he saying here? Well, the Jewish people prided themselves on keeping the law of God. And really, they divided the law into individual parts. And so a lot of Jewish people had this mentality, well, look, I'm a law keeper. They were very proud about that. I keep the law of God. And because they divided the law into parts, they didn't see discrimination really as a big sin. They didn't see preferential treatment as a problem. I'm a Jew. I keep the law of God. They were very arrogant and very proud. And what James says is, look, the law is a unit. 
You may keep all these other laws. You may not commit murder. You may not commit adultery. But if you violate the law by showing discrimination or preferential treatment, you break the whole law of God because the law is a unit. In other words, to break one part of the law is to break all of the law because the law is a unit. He's telling them, stop having this mentality that you think you're so good because you keep all of these laws, but this one over here is not a big deal. You know, we do that too, don't we? You know, yesterday we went out um, homeless outreach, and I was talking to a guy, giving the gospel to him, and I asked him, I said, you know, you're familiar with the law of God. One of the commandments is, thou shalt not lie. I said, you ever lied? He said, no. I said, one of the commandments is, thou shalt not steal. You ever stolen? No. One of the commandments is, obey your father and mother. Have you ever disobeyed him? No. And I thought, man, this guy, he's really tough here. He's got the problem of pride, and I got to point that out eventually. So then I kept going through this, and so the mentality was, you know, hey, I'm a pretty good person. This is how people in our culture think because they use other people as comparisons. Well, I ended up exposing in a gracious way his sin because I said, Jesus said, if you look to lust after a woman, you commit adultery in your heart. I said, you ever, you ever commit adultery in your mind or fornication? And he smiled. He said, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. But see, that's the mentality is in our culture, non-believers see themselves as pretty good. They don't look at certain things as sin. Discrimination, prejudice, that's a sin. James says it is a violation of the law of God. We are convicted as lawbreakers. And listen, we got to call it out for what it is. Sometimes I have to do that in my life when it comes to other sins, because you know what we all have a tendency to do in our fallenness is rationalize and justify certain behaviors. Well, it's just a mistake. Sometimes we have to call it out for what it is in our own time with the Lord. Lord, you are right. This is wrong, and you name the sin. Because you know what it does? It helps you to embrace it and deal with it. And so James says, you're a lawbreaker. He says, yeah, you may not commit murder, you may not commit adultery, but if you violate the law of God, it's as if you've broken the whole law because the Jews divided the law into parts. And he says, no, you're a transgressor of the law because the law holds together. It's like if I took a hammer and walked up to a car and I took the hammer and I smashed the windshield, that section where I smashed the windshield is one localized area. But you know what happens? When I hit that one spot, it shatters the whole windshield. And that is is with the law of God. You break one part, you break it all as it were. Now, you've heard me talk about Chuck Smith, who was the pastor of the Calvary Chapel movement, when God birthed that in the 1960s and 70s with the hippies. Many of them, as you know, were into riotous living, uh, free love, uh, drugs, rock and roll, all that stuff. And when they would crowd the areas of California where Chuck and Kay Smith lived, Chuck Smith said he didn't have a heart for them. He said he didn't love them like he should have. And he was driving by and saw a bunch of them. And he said, he said in his heart, get a job and take a shower and get some clothes. And he said the Holy Spirit convicted him that he was not loving them the way Christ loved them, that he needed to see them through the eyes of God. He realized that he got convicted as a lawbreaker. You know who God used to reach them initially? Was his wife. His wife was intrigued by these hippies. Why did they act the way they acted? So they told their kids, invite them to the house. And so he started ministering to them at the house, and then the whole movement of Calvary Chapel was birthed from that. But listen, Chuck did not love those people the way God wanted him to love them, not that he approved of their lifestyle. He said, I was convicted by the law. I violated the law by showing unbiblical, sinful discrimination. And so that's what we need to see it as sin, according to God. Well, there's one final reason for this morning why we're to reject sinful discrimination, and that is this, will be held accountable by God. Notice, if you will, verses 12 and 13, James says this, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. I want you to notice that those two terms are not mutually exclusive, law of liberty. Laws typically restrict, but notice the Bible is a law of liberty. What normally would be seen as restrictive sets us free. He says, look, I want you to speak in such a way and act in such a way as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty. In other words, don't act as if you're unaccountable. He's saying one day you're going to be judged by what you say, what you do, and how you treat other people. 
And the implication is you're sitting on judgment on these people that are poor. You're sitting on judgment on black people or white people or people of a different race. And ultimately, you're playing the role of judge when ultimately God is the final judge and you're going to stand before him. Because he says this, judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, the Bible says that all of us have a day where we're going to stand before God. If you're a believer, you're going to stand at the judgment or be a seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, that is not for condemnation. It's not for hell. The Bible says at the Bema seat, you're going to be evaluated in terms of how you lived your Christian life from the moment you were saved on. You're going to be given a life review. And you're going to be rewarded commensurate with your faithfulness to God. Now, how that works out, I don't know. But all of us are going to have wood, hay, and stubble that burns up, according to 1 Corinthians 3. On the other hand, the non-believer is not going to the Bema seat. They're going to the great white throne judgment, according to Revelation chapter 20. That judgment is strictly for non-believers. It is not for rewards. It is for condemnation and the sentencing of hell. So whether you're at the believer's judgment or the non-believer's judgment, we all have a day where we're given a life review, and James says, look, you need to live your Christian life in such a way that you speak and act as those who are going to give an account. And he says this, if your lifestyle is one of showing no mercy to people, and I think here he's talking to the rich who are oppressing the poor, he's saying, if you show no mercy to people as a lifestyle, he says, God will not show mercy to you. Pretty strong words. Now, this creates a tension because when you read this, you think, well, James seems to imply that if I show mercy to people, God will take me into heaven. It almost seems like a works-based salvation. And the answer is no. He's not saying that showing mercy to people or showing love to people will merit eternal life. But what he's saying is this. Showing mercy to people and showing love to people gives evidence that I am a true Christian. Mercy and love do not save me, but they give evidence that I am saved. If I claim to be a Christian, I claim to be born again, but you never see the fruit of mercy, you never see the fruit of love, you have to question whether or not that person's saved. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He's not saying, hey, if you're just a nice guy, a nice gal, you show mercy to people, God will take you into heaven. No. Mercy reveals the state of my heart. It reveals whether or not I'm regenerate or not. Do you remember in Matthew 25 when Jesus is separating the sheep from the goat? What did he say to those on his right who were believers? He said, come into my father's kingdom. He said, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in jail, you came and visited me. When I was sick, you came and visited me. When I needed clothes, you put them on me. And they say, Lord, when did we do all that? He says, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Now, when you read Matthew 25, that verse, you would tend to think, well, it almost seems like if we do acts of kindness, God is going to accept us into heaven. No, God can tell whether a person is regenerate or not, whether they're saved or not, by looking at the pattern of their life. The pattern of their life, the fruit of their life reveals the root of their life, whether or not they're saved. In fact, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, John says this, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. How do I know I'm a Christian? Not by loving other people. Loving other people doesn't save me, but it does give evidence that I am saved. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Love doesn't save me, but it does give evidence that I am saved. And so what James is saying is, look, you need to act in such a way, you need to speak in such a way, knowing that you're accountable to God. And listen, we got a lot of people in our culture today that don't feel like they're accountable to God, or they believe in God, but they believe in a benign deity. They believe in a God that doesn't judge. They believe in a a Santa Claus up in heaven that basically is going to bless everybody and let everybody into heaven. And he's saying, no. There is coming a day where there's going to be a life review, and God will look at your life. Did you show mercy to other people? In other words, sinful discrimination is not an exhibition of showing uh, love to others, not showing mercy to others. 
Do you show love and mercy to others? Because typically people that have hate, they're discriminatory. Typically that reveals that they show no mercy and love to people. And he says, look, judgment will be without mercy for those who show no mercy. I watched the movie Till. I don't know if you've heard of that movie. If you haven't rented it, rent it. It's a true story about a single mother and her son. And this was during the period of segregation. They lived in Chicago and things were tense. Well, her son decided to visit relatives, I believe, in Mississippi, where racism was very, very strong during that time. And she was all nervous about her son going there, and she told him, you need to keep your mouth shut, you need to be very respectful towards the white man, blah, 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 blah. Well, long story short, he said something. They took it wrong, and so they took him out of the relative's house while he was in Mississippi, and they beat him mercilessly to death. And it devastated the mother when she got the news that her son was murdered and thrown into a river. And she did something that really all of us would probably be aghast even today. She decided rather than have a closed casket, she was going to take her son's body that was beaten beyond recognition, and she was going to have an open casket for the world to see. Because she wanted people to see this is the result of racism and what happens when it takes place. And you know, my wife and I, we were crying watching this movie. It was very moving. And I kept thinking to myself this verse, mercy will not be shown to those who are merciless. Those people that did this, I'll tell you what, they will be given no mercy if they don't repent and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know if they have or if they did. I think they passed away. Or you think of the guy in North Korea, Kim Jong-un. You ever read the stories of what he does to the North Korean people? Absolutely no mercy. I've read some of the stories of how they treat people in the labor camps. It is absolutely brutal. And they do it because it brings them excitement. They do, they do this refined cruelty to the people. And I thought about this verse. Judgment will be shown to those who show no mercy. That man in North Korea shows no mercy to his people. And you know what? When he stands before God and we pray that he comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, but if he doesn't, when he stands before God and cries for mercy, you know what God is going to say to him? Depart from me. I never knew you. Mercy will not be shown. And so we're accountable to God. And again, this doesn't mean we walk in fear, but it does mean that we watch what we say and what we do. So James says we're to reject sinful discrimination. And there are six reasons why. Let's review them. Number one, it is inconsistent with being a Christian. Number two, it is often based on sinful motives. We need to have biblical motives. Thirdly, it fails to see people the way God sees them. Look at people through the eyes of God. Fourthly, it fails to demonstrate biblical love. Do I love people the way God loves them? Fifthly, it is a violation of the law of God. And finally, we will be held accountable by God. I would surmise that most of us in this room don't engage in a lifestyle of discrimination that is sinful or preferential treatment, but we all have to guard our hearts because it can slip in in ways that sometimes we're blinded to. We say things, we do things, and sometimes we have our own blind spots. Is it a problem in America? Absolutely. Is it the problem that the media is making? No, from my perspective. But we need to balance, and we need to make sure that we love people, we don't discriminate, but we don't water the truth down. We have to have that balance. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word to us, reminding us of the evil of discrimination. Father, we see it in our society at large, and it's even worked its way into the church in some areas. Help us, Lord, not to engage in this, but help us, Lord, to follow your will and your plan. God, I do pray for all the discrimination that's going on in the government and our society. Father, we know it's going to exist until you come back at your return. But God, I pray that we'd continue to root it out in churches and businesses and corporations, even in our government, and especially help your church because we have no excuse. Forgive us, Lord, when we fall short in this area. We thank you this morning for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close in worship. And again, I want to remind us this week as we go out, let's be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Remember, each one reach one. I want to encourage you this year to reach one person before the year's out to plant a seed. I made up ABC cards. We just got them in this week. Next week, we're going to be putting them out 
for you to take several of them, and I'll go into what we can do as a congregation to kind of collectively reach out and plant seeds. But let's worship God as we close out the service.